Welcome everyone. This is a little recording with a small group here. Thanks Kevin Vagona for asking me to come on and have a little talk. So uh, first of all, let's just just quiet my minds. You can take a deep breath if you like. Just let your fingers and toes go soft. If you've got your fingers scrunched up in fists, you can just let them out. Just let, just let the thoughts be still in your mind. When your thoughts, when your thoughts are just stilled a little bit. It's a bit easier for uh, the message of Jesus and the Holy Spirit to get through to us. Today, uh, today's recording is based on lesson 26. My attack thoughts are attacking my invulnerability and that can sound just reading that you can really not hear anything because though that even that that lesson can sound like blah 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 so i'm going to break i'm going to spend some time breaking this lesson down because it's i think it's an important lesson because where when I was studying the course I didn't really understand what he meant by attack thoughts or I didn't know where the attack was and attack attack always seemed to me the ego as the ego because remember we've only got two thought systems there's no Kate or Kevin or Penelope uh, there's only a there's only the ego thoughts and we we as part of that forces thought system we label ourselves in that label as Kate Penelope and Kevin come into our mind and give a label to a thing that we think we are. We somehow think we are this body. So we look down and we look at a thing that we wouldn't even know is our body, but we say, the thoughts say this is a body. So it's a, it's a self-concept that's being made. So we have to believe we're a body, that we are a body, that the thoughts say, this is my body. And we have projected this body and it seems to be, so we've, what we've, part of what we've done when falling asleep, going into a world of separation what we've done is we think that the pain is in our body so we might have a pain in our hand or in our back or in our foot but it's never in the body because the body is a lifeless thing it has no life it, it doesn't have a beingness on its own 
the pain is always from the guilt in the mind. And when the guilt is healed, the body will not experience any pain or sickness. So that's why once you get that, once even if you don't get it, you don't understand it, but you hear it and it's right through the course, that teaching. Um, once you even, once it's identified where the cause of all your suffering is, it's the thoughts and the grievances and the fears and the attack thoughts. Once you know that's the problem, you can go, you can then, every time you feel pain in your body, you can tell yourself, I've got some grievances that are causing me to feel pain in my body or I have fear in my mind. So when, so pain in the body is an indicator straight away that I have a grievance or a resentment or um, something, some block in my mind to the awareness of love's presence. So once you get that, because that is such a key aspect to the course's teachings, because it means that you don't try, you give up trying to seek out solutions in the world for things of the body. So a lot of people like me spent years and years doing diet and vitamins and different things I ate to heal the problems of the body and when I came to the course and I finally understood the message it was oh great I let all things I just let I just threw out the vitamins or I gave gave them away or just ate them up over time it didn't matter I let go of all the beliefs that somehow this particular food or drink was going to heal my body aches and pains and tiredness and fatigue. And I started going to the cause. Jesus says, the cause of all your suffering is the guilt in your mind. The guilt from thinking you're separated from God. But I couldn't relate to that to start with, but that eventually was revealed. It was eventually I saw the guilt in my mind, but at the time it was all covered up. So just work with where you're at. Work with exactly what's happening for you, where you're at today, where you're sitting, what grievance do I have right now? That's your forgiveness work. That's it. And then every day becomes my forgiveness work today. This, my life is now to undo all the grievances, resentments and fears in my mind. And Jesus says the body will be perfectly healthy as you undo the egoic mind. And eventually all those grievances, they're just beliefs. They're just thoughts and beliefs. And what happens is eventually you see that all those thoughts and beliefs create the sense of a separate self a me, what we call a me, an I. They actually perpetuate the idea that there's an I or a me, a real separate self to be hurt and harmed. And that has to go because once you've seen through all those beliefs, once you've just let go and you've seen the false as false, there's nothing left but God's mind of love. And then the body is just used as a conduit for that love and that's it it says you know the holy spirit's just going to repurpose your life your body everything in your life anything that you have any abilities anything you own it's just all going to be about love that you are love god is love everyone is love and here i am in the world just liquid love liquid love of god pouring out for me, pouring out to you. And that's it. You know, like he says in the course, you know, we're like a big mirror. So God shines on us and we just like, we're just like holding up a mirror and just letting that light come through us and shine to everyone. And that's it. Just love.
that's it's really the final thing is just saying that I am love, everything is love. God is love, God is the most beautiful love. And it's the happy dream then because there's no goals, there's no personal goals, there's nothing to get, nothing to do, nothing to be. Because in that seeing that I am love and everything is love, well, what you say, I want to work really hard to be more to be more love, or well, how can you be more love than you already are? If you're all all encompassing love, you're love. There's nothing to get because you already got love. So all the goals and all the idols of the world are fallen away. And you're just sitting in love. And your purpose now is really directed by the Holy Spirit. And his directions is just the voice in your mind now. What you do and say is just like a new GPS. It's not the ego. It's, it's the Holy Spirit GPS. And it just says, go here, do this, say yes to this, go here, say no to that. You know, get up now, go for a walk, get on a group, do this lesson, say this, express this. So you don't have to worry about anything in the future. You don't even have, you don't have to, the past has gone from your mind and you don't have to worry about the future. Because you realise there is no future, there's only now. And now is the only time to be happy. And it's always now. So happiness is always now. And you're missing. You're missing the now where happiness is when you're worrying about the future and lamenting about the past. You're literally in a state because the past isn't here. Past is gone. The future's not here. So you're basically thinking about nothing and going into a state of um, upset, which need not be. You need not be upset. If you just trust the Holy Spirit, he, honestly, just learn to trust, develop that trust. Really be vigilant in trusting. Um, so that's my little talk, um, just, just bringing everybody to, to remind everyone about how we can be in the world but not of it. Now, I talk to a lot of people that... Um, have these attack thoughts and um, they're really not aware of the cause of the suffering. Uh, so I really want to go through this lesson. It's a really good lesson for helping you identify attack. My attack thoughts are attacking my in vulnerability. So some of the words that we're going to really focus on in this lesson are the word attack, attack thoughts, vulnerable and invulnerable. It is surely obvious that if you can be attacked, you are not invulnerable. So let's consider this. I'm going to go through it really slowly line by line, because this is how you have to go through those lessons. Line by line, you have to look. So he's telling us that if, that if I can be attacked, it has to be that I am not invulnerable. So in other words, let's consider this. Do I think that I can be attacked? And if I say, I have to be honest, and if I say yes, I think I can be attacked. Um, then he says that I am taking myself to be something that is it that is that is not invulnerable. In other words, I have to be taking myself to be something that be that is vulnerable. If I'm not invulnerable, then I'm vulnerable. So. I'm taking myself to be um, something that can be hurt and harmed. 
the reason why we go through this slowly is because um, the the thought, the idea about being attacked is really like a, one of the central themes of the course and understanding it and doing, it's going to be sort of doing, it's getting us to do an inquiry, but we're going to do this really slowly so we can inquire. So we have to tell ourselves that if we think that we can be attacked, we have to hold the belief that we are vulnerable. It has to happen, it has to be one thing leads to the other. You see attack as a real threat, so we have to say to ourselves when we read this lesson, okay, well if I saw someone coming towards me with a knife going to stab me, I would see that as a real threat, right? You have to be honest with yourself as you're going through these lessons because the only way you get to actually be free is really being honest. That is because you believe that you can really attack. So in other words, um, I could, if I was wielding a knife, I would see that I could attack. Uh, if I was holding the knife, and someone else was coming up to me, I would have to believe that if I stabbed them, that I could really attack, right? And what would have effects through you must also have effects on you. So if, if the effect of me stabbing someone else or speaking nasty words to hurt someone. If they, if they could have effects through me, so if I see my harmful words hurting someone or a knife stabbing someone and saying something through me, so if I'm saying my words or my actions through me can attack, therefore, they would have to, someone else saying nasty words to me or coming to me and stabbing me would have to attack me as well. It is this law that will ultimately save you, but you are misusing it now. What he's saying is that the un, really the undoing of this law is what's going to save us. Because we, because we have to look at what we believe about attack. We have to really slow it all down and really look. This is what he's asking us to do. You must therefore learn how it can be used for your best interests rather than against them. Okay, so this law of attack, of someone attacking me and me being able to attack them, um, we're going to learn how this law is going to help us. The best interest is to have it, how it's going to get undone, how it's going to be used, how the change of this law is going to be used to help us free us. Because your attack thoughts will be projected, you will fear attack. And if you fear attack, you must believe that you are not invulnerable. So, um, Let's just have a look at those first couple of lines. Because your attack thoughts will be projected. So let's have a look at um, when we imagine saying something unkind to someone or stabbing someone, they're just thoughts. And when we imagine someone saying something unkind to us or coming towards us with a knife, they're just thoughts. They're, they're just thoughts and images in our mind. They're nowhere else except in our mind. But if I believe in attack, if I, so we're, what he's doing in the first paragraph is establishing what we believe. He's asking us to really look at what we believe 
and then he's really saying this is in your mind these thoughts are in your mind nowhere else because your attack thoughts will be projected you will fear attack so um <clears throat> Say, say I, <coughs> say I imagine myself, say I feel angry with someone and I think I'm going to give them a piece of my mind and I'm going to say this, this and this and I'm going to put them in their place and I'm going to remind them of something they've done or something they've said and I'm going to, you know, and you go through these scenarios in your mind and you're like... <coughs> What happens is we get caught up in all the, all the actual, yeah, they said this and they shouldn't have, and I'm going to say that, and then I'm going to say this, and then, and then um, we might even have this idea, we might even think about that somebody has said something nasty to us in the past, and we think about it. And what we're doing, so when we're in that, we're actually focused on we're focused on um, the the we're focused on um, it is attack, but what we don't realise is so you, so your mind's caught up in all this attacking, but you don't say to yourself in that moment when you're really caught up in the story, you don't tell yourself. I have a belief in attack. That's not something that you hold. So the mind sort of like whirling and whirling around in the story of attack. Yeah, they said this and then I'm going to say that. And if they say this back, back, then I'm going to go there and I'm going to call the police. And so we go into this whole story. But Jesus is asking us to really get below that story and just tell ourselves that if we see somebody uh, seemingly attacking us and we see ourselves attacking them, which are words or, you know, something, it's a belief in attack and they're actually attack thoughts. Attack thoughts therefore make you vulnerable in your own mind which is where the attack thoughts are. So all this scenario that you're going on with in your mind is actually happening in your mind. That's the belief in attack. And, I'll sh and we, it's going to go a bit deeper than that, but that's the, the most important thing here is to understand that he's telling us to look in our mind and that what we're doing is we've got attack thoughts in our mind and those thoughts of attack what they hold underneath because you see what we're doing here when we're going through these lessons we're going to like it's like jesus is, is their teacher he's giving us an inquiry lesson just see every lesson as someone giving you like an, an inquiry process so you're sitting, you don't have to go to a retreat to sit in front of a teacher to do inquiry. You just sit in front of Jesus and hear his words and this is an inquiry. So he's asking us, have a look in your mind. Stop, just stop for a minute when you're in all, all this big story of he said, she said, they shouldn't, da, da, da. And just say to yourself, just look and say, I ha all that whole story has I have to believe in it I have to have the belief that I can be attacked and that they can be attacked it has to be held in my mind to have that because if I say right I'm going to the, go to the police or I'm going to do this or I'm going to say that and make them realize this or I'm not going to speak to them, that's an attack, that's an idea of attack. What underlies all that stuff is, is a deeper meaning that attack is possible. 
And what he's really saying in this lesson is that those, those attack thoughts, the attack thoughts, which I'm talking about this top level story. So the top level story is being, you know, being annoyed with someone and I'm going to say this and I'm going to stop speaking to them or I'm going to confront them about this. All that stuff, all those thoughts are the attack thoughts. But what he's asking us to get below that is that all those thoughts, the belief, the belief that they hold and is hidden is that I can be attacked and so can they. There's a belief that I can hurt them and a belief that they can hurt me. That's what those thoughts really hold. That's what's behind them. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go up to someone and say anything unless I thought I could hurt them. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to put them in their place is hurt them. And I believe, well, they did this to me. They said this, they hurt me. All those thoughts is, hold the belief that it's possible to attack. That it's, it's what he's saying. He's trying to say, you then, all those thoughts, hold the idea that you can attack someone and they can attack you. That's what those thoughts generate. The idea that I can attack and they can attack me. That's what's being held in our mind. That's what's underneath. That's what's underneath those thoughts. Um, so he's saying attack thoughts and invulnerability cannot be accepted together. So he's telling us that any thoughts that we have in our mind can't, where we cannot have a feeling of being invulnerable while we have attack thoughts in our mind. They can't meet. They cannot be accepted together. So if I ha even have the slightest belief um, that I can attack someone or they can attack me, I cannot experience myself as invulnerable. I'm all, I'm holding the belief. It's, it's hidden in the idea, the original thoughts, I don't see them as attack thoughts. I don't say, I'm gonna, I'm, you know, I'm gonna go and tell that person or I'm not gonna speak to that person because they did this to me. All that, and that's what you hear everyone saying here. But all they're really saying is if you can hear them saying, I believe that I can be attacked and I believe I can attack. I have that belief because I think that their words can attack me, that I'm this thing that can be attacked by words or a knife. And where are those, where are those thoughts in my mind? There's nothing else except thoughts in my mind because remember, I can only be affected by my thoughts. So the story, the story in the mind holds, holds the belief that they're, that people that that I can be attacked and so can they, and then underneath that, underneath that, the next step down is that I have to be a thing that's vulnerable to attack. I have to be something that is vulnerable to some type of attack. I have to hold that belief. If I if I that story holds that belief that I'm this very fragile, tiny thing that can be attacked at any minute from anything, anywhere. And so therefore, with that thought, I, that hidden belief that I'm this vulnerable thing, in other words, all that belief and all that story, um, I cannot have this idea or this thought that I'm invulnerable, that I'm spirit, whilst I'm maintaining those thoughts and beliefs. And that's really what he's saying is that they, they can't meet up. Your true self uh, can't get a look in while you're holding a story of attack and the thoughts of attack. 
The idea for today introduces the thought that you always attack yourself first. Why would I always attack myself first? What does he mean by that? Why? Because I'm attacking myself by believing that I can be attacked. That is the attack. The belief that I am something that can be attacked. That's, that's, what, that's what is the attack on me. The thought that I can be harmed. I'm just going to let you rest on that because that can be a bit of a mind bender. You might blank out a little bit on that one. I'll just let you rest for a few minutes. Right. The belief that I can be attacked is the attack thought, is the attack upon myself. So the story, what's hidden underneath the story is the belief in attack. And what's hidden under that is I'm a vulnerable thing. And that belief that I can be attacked and I'm vulnerable is an attack. So let's bring in, and probably go through it as well, but let's bring in this idea that your spirit, something that can't be harmed or threatened. So as spirit, if you have a thought, I'm vulnerable, I can be attacked, that Thought is an attack on yourself as spirit. Do you see? That is what takes you away from you being invulnerable, from the idea that you're invulnerable. That belief that I can be attacked is an attack on your experience of being spirit. If attack thoughts must entail the belief that you are vulnerable, their effect is to weaken you in your own eyes. So, so as spirit, we're limitless. We're this beautiful limitless love. And if we then, as spirit, have this thought, oh, I'm this little thing that can be attacked, and look over there, they're a little thing that can be attacked. Therefore, that underpins that I'm the vulnerable thing and then I feel weak. I've got a belief, oh, I'm this little vulnerable thing, I can be attacked, and now I'm very weak. Because if I believe on this thing that can be attacked, I will experience myself as weak rather than strong. Thus, they, the attack thoughts, have attacked your perception of yourself. So the belief in attack the belief that I am this thing that's invulnerable actually attacks our perception of ourselves because our true self is spirit. And because you believe in them, because you believe in those thoughts, you can no longer believe in yourself. A false image of yourself has come to take the place of what you are. So a false image, so a false image is a body, a little self, little bit of skin and hair and eyes. This false image has come to take the place of myself, my true self, limitless, formless spirit. A little drink. <laughs> Practice with today's idea will help you understand that vulnerability or invulnerability is the result of your own thoughts. Nowhere else, my thoughts, and that's it. Whether I feel vulnerable or invulnerable is nowhere else except my own thoughts. Because if I believe that I can be attacked or can attack, they are thoughts, thoughts in my mind. They give me the belief that I, those thoughts attack my belief 
in being invulnerable. Nothing except your thoughts can attack you. <laughs> Nothing except your thoughts can attack you. And remember that those thoughts, he says those thoughts about, you know, I'm going to harm them, or oh, and they can harm me, or, or the, you know, something can harm me. Um, they're thoughts. They're just thoughts. Nothing except your thoughts can make you think you are vulnerable. This is why we have to deal with our thoughts and look at our thoughts and undo our thoughts, inquire into our thoughts, give them over to the Holy Spirit, let them go, have them replaced, accept the atonement. All thoughts. What is the ego? A thought system, a fear thought, a guilt thought, all thoughts. The ego is not a thing, it's just a thought. The Holy Spirit is the answer to the thoughts. So what are we? Mind. Where are our thoughts? In our, in our mind. Where is the mind? You can't know. You can, a thought has no form. The mind has no form. It's not in the brain because it's like saying my thoughts are in my hand. Thoughts don't happen. Thoughts don't happen in a brain. There, where are they? Where are your thoughts? Where's your mind? They're nowhere. You can't find them. So where are your thoughts? <laughs> These are really good things to think about because they really help you undo. Nothing except your thoughts can make you think you are vulnerable and nothing except your thoughts can prove to you this is not so. So went that last sentence, and nothing except your thoughts can prove to you that this is not so, he's saying that Holy Spirit will bring thoughts in. It'll help you undo this. So six practice periods are required in applying today's idea. A full two minutes should be attempted for each of them, although the time may be reduced to a minute if discomfort is too great. Do not reduce it further. The practice period should begin with repeating the idea for today and closing your eyes and reviewing the unresolved questions whose outcomes are causing you concern. The concern may take the form of depression, worry, anger, a sense of imposition, fear, foreboding or preoccupation. Any problem is yet unsettled that tends to reoccur in your thoughts during the day is a suitable subject. You will not be able to use very many for any one practice period because a longer time than usual should be spent with each one. Today's idea should be applied as follows. Now, what he's going to do, he's going to ask us to bring in a situation and then he's going to ask us to give the distressing possibilities that our thoughts say about that situation. So remember, situation that we come up with, a situation in our mind, and then the possibilities, the distressing possibilities associated with that situation. So if you've got pen and paper guys, if you'd like to just write down one situation um, reviewing the an unresolved question whose outcomes are causing your concern. So just write down, I am concerned about, it could be something like getting coronavirus or not having a job or not having enough money to retire. 
whatever it is you're concerned about. Then go over every possible outcome that has occurred to you in that connection and which has caused you concern, referring each one quite specifically. So it wants us to get really specific here. And right, I am afraid such and such will happen. I'm afraid I will die, that death might happen, uh, you know, that I might get sick, be in hospital, uh, so it will always be about something to do with the body, it's always about you as a body. <laughs> So let's write down what we're afraid of. I encourage you, if you're watching this video or if you've done lesson 26 before, we're going to do it. Do all these lessons properly. Really allocate time to them because you've got to remember that Jesus is the highest teacher you can have and this is his inquiry he's come up with this inquiry for us don't overlook the value of this inquiry that he's giving us here in this lesson it is coming from the christ mind outside time and space therefore it would be the highest level of inquiry. This is not something that you can overlook or downplay the value of what he's asking us to do here. Very, very important not to skim over these inquiries. Extremely important not to skim over these things. These are a way to be free. These are given to us by the highest mind. And take your time to really dedicate yourself to sitting quietly and doing this inquiry. The reason why we have to write this out I would encourage you to write it, not just say it, write it out, because you probably don't even know what you're worried about and all the things that you're afraid will happen from that concern. You're probably not even aware of it. It's fantastic to get it out on paper. If you're doing those exercises properly, you should have some five or six distressing possibilities available for each situation you use and quite possibly more. It's much more helpful to cover a few situations thoroughly. Okay, so just maybe three or four then touch on a larger number because they're all the same. They all have the same beliefs in them. But what he wants, why he wants you to do three or four is he wants you to get an idea, you're going to get an aha moment at some stage, that they're all really saying the same thing. As the list of anticipated outcomes for each situation continues, you will probably find some of them, especially those that occur to you towards the end, less acceptable to you. Try, however, to treat them all alike to whatever extent you can. In other words, uh, we try to hide. I know when I first did these things, I didn't, I sort of wanted to hide. I was like, oh, no, I don't want to write that down. He's asking us to write everything down, even the silliest thing that you could think of. Because what's happening are all these thoughts are in our mind. They're looping around. We're coming, it's the ego, right? But we're, we're 
we're so in the ego, we have no idea that we're not the ego at this stage. These are the early lessons. So it's really trying to get us, getting us to look at the thoughts in our mind, to write down what's in our mind. He's asking us to look at them, get them down on paper so we can see them and go, wow, look what, look what I'm believing. Look at all these beliefs. Look at these situations and this is what the ego is saying here. After you have named each outcome of which you are afraid, tell yourself that thought is, a t is an attack upon myself. Why would that thought be an attack upon myself? Because it is a belief that the belief in attack and the belief in attack attacks the invulnerability of spirit it has to it's something the belief in that i am this thing as a body and can be attacked attacks attacks my invulnerability or spirit the idea that i am spirit it attacks it. In other words, it erases the idea that I am spirit. It comes in and overrides the idea that I am spirit. When we say, I, when I first did this lesson, it took me a long, long time to really understand what it was trying to point me to. It took me years. Um, I'm hoping I can shed a little bit of light of what it means. It just sounded like gobbledygook when I first read this. But that's why just sort of going slowly and just sort of explaining it a little bit clearer. But those um, thoughts, I am afraid that I will get sick, is an attack thought because it attacks the idea that I am something that can't get sick. Right, if I hold that thought, that thought erases, when I say attacks the thought, sometimes it's better to you, I like to use the thought, like it dissolves or erases the, the idea that I am invulnerable on spirit. So we have to see how um, those thoughts, those thoughts, I am afraid such and such will happen. We tolerate those thoughts so much. We tolerate them, we think they're normal. We talk to each other, yeah, I'm afraid this will happen. Yeah, I'm afraid that'll happen. Yeah, this situation I find myself in, I'm scared this and this and this. I might die, I might get sick, I might be in hospital, I might never recover, I might have lung problems, I might have heart problems, I might have leg problems. Every single thought is an attack or dissolves the idea that you're invulnerable, that your spirit. And that's why holding an attack thought or holding the idea is an attack on God's plan for salvation, which is God's plan for salvation is that you experience yourself as something that is invulnerable. So we have to see that those thoughts are the problem. We're tolerating those thoughts. And he actually gives us um, the answer in the next, in the following so many lessons coming up after that, um, the way out. Above all else I want to see, above all else I want to see things differently. So in other words, above all else, I want to look at this situation differently. So that first thing where I am concerned about this situation. Say we just say I'm concerned about getting the coronavirus. Well, that's a pretty topical thing here right now in the world. I'm concerned about the coronavirus and then I'm afraid I'll get sick, I'll be um, disabled in some way forever, I might die. 
um, I might I might spread it to others. Um, it's it's all about bodies, all about bodies and sickness. My thoughts. So, above all else, I want to see things differently. I want to see this situation differently. So. Um, You will not question what you have already defined. And the purpose of these exercises is to ask questions and receive the answers. In saying, above all else, I want to see this coronavirus situation differently. You are committing yourself to seeing, in other words, perceiving, having other thoughts come into your mind. So we're not going to go through the remedy um, today. Just wanted to go through these. Uh, the idea of attack, just to keep you there in that lesson, so so you can see that the belief in attack, the belief that I can be attacked and others can be attacked, the belief in that is the problem. That's the problem, not the story. The story hides the belief. So we have to sink below what of, what's my belief. And so we're coming up in the inquiry, we're coming up with all our beliefs. And then we go on to, okay, Holy Spirit, above all else, I want to see it all this differently. And we wait for an answer. Um, I did. I wanted to put a little, a little answer in towards the end, which is it. But all those other lessons are going to help that lead on. Uh, God is everything I see. I have invented. I'm not the victim. There is another way of looking at the world. I could see peace instead of this. All those that go towards um, the remedy for those. That, so that the belief in attack. So nothing real can be threatened. It really ties in with this lesson. Nothing unreal exists. So the truth is that you're not a body. We never came into a body. We think we've, uh, we've, we're in a dream, a total unreal world. It seems real because we think we think our body's touching something or getting a, t you know, a knife going at us. We think that's, that's us. So we have to really work hard in doing those lessons and applying those lessons and have the experience, eventually have an experience of ourselves as something else other than a body. <clears throat> we don't deny the body. What we do is we move more into an experience of mind, of the love of God, God's mind, love's mind. So has anyone got any questions there or else we might just wrap, wrap this up? I didn't want to make this video longer. Yeah. Yes, yeah, I'd like to. Um, I'd like to give an example actually of a few weeks ago um, at work. Um, as a child that appears to be quite rude and quite disrespectful towards the staff. And so, you know, he'll do some, he'll do something that, you know, he needs to, we need to correct him on and um, he'll turn around and he'll, you know, laugh at you and he'll pull faces and then he'll run off and that sort of thing anyway. And I didn't realize that, I was getting triggered anyway. And so one day um, I said to one of the uh, staff, I said, oh, I really don't like him. And as soon as I said it, I thought, hang on a minute, that's actually not true. I thought, in reality, I don't dislike him. I thought, so there's something in me. So I couldn't deal with it at the time because... 
there's too much to worry. So when I came home, I thought, right, I've got to, so I wrote down the reasons. I said, why do I dislike him? So I wrote down the reasons. And it was because I believe that he is rude and disrespectful and dishonorable to me. And, um, and I thought, okay. And I thought, well, there's no such thing as rude. There's no such thing as dishonorable. There's no such thing as disrespectful. He's not doing any of that because it just doesn't exist. And so then I was able to just keep asking a few more questions and realize that actually, no, that's not what he's doing. It's just a call uh, for love. So, yeah. So this lesson, when you're saying this today, it, straight away I thought of that and I thought, yeah, I can, I can see where I was attacking myself. He had nothing to do with it at all. He was not attacking me. He's just, you know, maybe calling for love by needing attention or whatever it is, but I was purely attacking myself. So now I've found I don't dislike him. I've found that I'll, when he, you know, when he does that to anyone, no matter, because he does it to all the, appears to do it to all the staff. So when he, when he does that, I'll say, oh, what message is he holding out for us? What is he calling for? You know, and like the other, the other day when he um, did a similar thing um, and he, he ran off, I turned it into a game instead. So, you know, um, I followed him and he was hiding behind a tree and I'm like, oh, where are you? Where have you gone? And you just distracted him and just got, got his mind totally off of it and, um, yeah, and just turned it into a into a game. So, yeah, so this is um, really powerful to have this because, yeah, it does make you realise especially when you break it down and you start to think what words are coming to mind as well with, with that, what, what beliefs, what words have we been brought up to believe, to believe in that we can turn around and say, well, actually, (laughs) yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. And, And this is the practical application, Penelope. Thanks for sharing that practical application that, um, you had a shift in perception rather than what we call fear, which is you're guilty of being, of causing me to feel upset and your behaviour and you need to change. You you come back to your own mind, you do inquiry as to what you're seeing, you have that healed, that perception healed, and then you come back and respond differently from love. Yeah. And it's it's saying uh, actually that's uh, just a call for love. Everything's a call for love or help, and that's really beautiful. And that's what we see in the end. That that's that's really what the ultimate. I mean, we're calling for love, aren't we? So if we're calling for love, so is everyone else. Can I share something? Uh, can you yes. hear me? Yes, Robin. It's Robin. Yeah, yep. I can't see you, but I can hear you. That's okay. <laughs> I can see you. <laughs> um, I'm um, like really in the thick of it at the moment and uh, I really am struggling and, you know, it's all, a, a lot of it is around my son David, but just one simple th- example The other night I was driving with him and um, he was the passenger and a car sort of came out a little bit in front of me onto into my lane from the right hand side. Um, You know, just, just a little bit, he was getting around something or whatever. And like, I didn't react at all. I was very aware and, you know, and, David straight away went, as I, you know, went past, he goes, why didn't you, that was, that's a time when you need to, you know, you need to honk him, put your horn on. And like, he was really, you know, like caught up in it. And, and I was just like really calm. And I just said, 
why? What happened? Nothing, nothing happened. It, you know, I saw, I saw him doing it. It wasn't, wasn't like he was about to hit me or anything. I mean, clearly the guy didn't have his indicator on and probably that would have been nice, but I didn't, it, it wasn't an issue for me, but David was really like, you know, he was going, he was then going into the future. Like he said, yeah, but he needs to know that he did wrong and he needs to know that he can't be doing that because what if he does it again and causes an accident? You know, like, so he's bringing up these scenarios and I was sitting there and I was thinking, oh my gosh, I was like, because I am very, very uh, concerned about David. I'm specifically using that word because that's what was in this lesson. I am concerned about David. Um, and obviously, I believe I am vulnerable and can be attacked. And I'm afraid that David is going to uh, just become very confrontational and uh, cynical and, you know, all this sort of stuff. And these thoughts are, at, are an attack upon myself. Um, but, like, what happened was I realised that there was nothing that I could say to him. There was nothing that I could answer to him where he was at that he was going to understand because, like, my opinion was I don't – nothing happened. Like, it, I, I just felt like there was nothing to discuss, you know, and – how did, but respond, I knew that... How did you Sorry? respond, How, How did, did you respond? Sorry? How did you respond? I went silent. I just went silent because I, I felt like there was nothing I could say because I couldn't uh, talk coarse stuff to him because he was really in his ego and doesn't get where I'm at. And I didn't want to go into the ego story either. And I was actually, like, I just didn't know what to say. I, I felt like, I felt like, no, I think I'm just going to let this go. And so I was silent and then David sort of went silent too and, and went, anyway, and then he started talking about something else and, you know, but it's been on my mind because, I mean, look, I wrote a page of stuff uh, about what I'm concerned about David and his future and, you know, whatever. And um, even though I felt like I handled that right because to me it wasn't, I didn't, because like David was wanting to, to, to say, yeah, but you were in the right here, you know, and I didn't care about that. But I couldn't say that to him. I just knew he wouldn't understand me saying um, you don't always have to have others realise you're in the right, you know? Um, so, so there's no right or wrong anywhere, anytime. It's True. Just, just stuff happening, just cars driving around. Um, yeah. Nothing's good or bad or right or wrong. Uh, it's whatever meaning we give it in our mind. We give it a meaning. I know. I couldn't so, say that to him, though. No, so your response, Robin, was really good because the quietness. Now, when in someone's like that and they're really angry and they're really triggered and they they believe in attack, they, you know, they and everybody is basically here. In that. So when you're with someone and they go seemingly get angry, mm. the best thing is to do is to focus on being extremely peaceful in your mind, which sounds like you did. Yeah. And Jesus says, invite them into your peace. Right, yeah. That's okay. the answer. So you can just see him just coming in and joining you in the peace. And the fact that you said he just calmed down and yep. then he just started talking about something else, his mind has been just come back to peace. Mm. I find sometimes... People just stop mid-sentence when they're talking to me now. 
Mm. They start talking about something that's upsetting them and they literally stop speaking in mid-sentence and then just start talking about something else. It's like this, I don't know how it works, but I just just remain in this deep peace. And the other day I was out walking my dog, Lily. I walk her every day. And this lady came along and she she was walking and then she just started talking about the lockdown and the coronavirus and she was like really upset and she just about I can't remember what she said but I just remember that she went in started to go into a story and I just stood there and I was just remained in this really deep peace I just didn't join her in any of it and I didn't say anything I, I obviously had a serene look on my face because what happens is when someone's angry people generally want to close them down it's like oh I can't stand that anger I have to stop it so you'll try to reason with them you'll try to say hey come on he was only pulling out or, hey, the coronavirus, the lockdowns, not, you know, most people would say something about either join them in their view and say, yeah, isn't it terrible? Or, hey, come on, it's all right, you know. So what's hidden behind that is this, um, is this belief. You just have to check for yourself because I know for me I had the belief that anger could hurt me and that anger was wrong and I, I literally had such big beliefs about anger it took me years to undo anger this idea that I, that anger was bad I couldn't be around anyone even if someone got slightly angry I could feel so much arise in me that I could feel like I had to get away and one of the really big undoings was to look at anger, what it is. And I think I've shared in some of my videos about um, that I finally had this job. And, of course, when, you get, when you're directed to any job or any place, it's all for undoing. Um, and I went into this job and I'm like, I don't even know why I'm in this job. You know, it was because it was in my period of undoing what I handed everything over to be, to have everything undone. So it was all about, well, what's left to undo? Well, how I know what's left to undo is when I get triggered. So I was in this job and I was quite peaceful and happy. And then my manager left for two weeks vacation and I was doing, I had to do her job. And the owner of the business, was extremely volatile and used to fly off the handle in rage. And um, about the second or third day I was there, he came in and he asked me something and I hadn't done something or I can't remember what it was, but he just went into a rage. And he was sort of saying things to me, but he was also... Uh, there was someone else in the building as well that he, at the time, he was upset with. So he was saying things to me and then he was turning around he was saying things to them and then he was coming back saying things to me. And, um, and what happened was I went right into the past in that moment. The past came flooding back. I had angry, an angry father that I'd really got upset about so I was sitting there I remember sitting there at this desk and it was an open plan office there was no nothing but desks and I felt very vulnerable in that moment to what seemed to be an attack and um, I remember um, he turned around he started talking to this other person who was very upset with about something else and while he was talking to them it was sort of like a side on view I was watching him and I just said, Holy Spirit, help me see this differently. I really want to undo this. It, you know, I knew then why I was in that job. I had to be in there to undo. I still had some tiny belief in my mind about anger and attack that I didn't know I had, right? So it had to be triggered. Um, and so I'm looking at him and I could feel this sense of... Um, you know, this unsettled feeling within me. 
And so I knew that there was a belief in something, belief in attack, belief. So as I was looking at him, you know, speaking really loudly and rudely, what you'd call rude and loud and saying very unkind things and very demanding, you could say, if you want to describe it all in ego's terms. Um, I was looking at him and the Holy Spirit came into my mind and said, um, just imagine him being an opera singer right now and imagine him singing really loudly to this person. It was like a mezzanine. We had a mezzanine area and this person was sort of... So the person was actually sitting up, like upstairs, but in an open area upstairs. And, you know, it's like opera singers, they sing to crowds and there's like a mezzanine. <laughs> so I literally, because he, he had this really loud voice that he would say, and all of a sudden I saw him going, la, 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 you know, and, and everything he said changed. It was just this big, like it was not even singing in English. He was singing like in, in Latin, you know, and he was just like this big opera singer. And the Holy Spirit said, this is what you're getting upset with. You're getting upset by a loud noise coming out of someone's mouth. And immediately I saw that. I had, I had like, that's why help me see this differently is what we have to say when we're saying something. So this is what I used to do is I, I want to help me see this differently. I'm feeling something coming up. I'm feeling attacked. I'm feeling really vulnerable and unsure. I feel like I want to run away. And, um, and, then, and then the next thing I was shown was this little baby, um, you know, like maybe a six-month-old baby in a little, in a little cot and it, it just mouthing words off and going blah 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 you know how babies bumble on you know they're just uh, they just don't say anything they're just making sounds out of their mouth and he said see that's what you're giving a meaning to imagine standing over a little baby's cot and they're saying all this blah 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 and you're saying hey i'm attacked by that stop doing that stop attacking me he said, that's what you do when you give meaning to sounds out of mouths. And in those two instances, seeing the opera singer and then seeing the baby, that was it. I was done. I looked at him. Everything dropped away from my mind that I could be attacked. I saw that it was sounds and nothing more. And I just had a big smile on my face. And I said to the boss, um, yep, let's get on with this. What can I do? What can, you know, obviously there was something I hadn't done or, and, you know, I just fixed it up. There was no fear in me. There was no, he's not guilty, I'm not guilty. That's why there is no world. The world appears when I think there's someone there attacking me. That's, that's what has to be, has to be undone on that level for me to see there is no world. I'm going to see that the world's not real when all of that, is undone but when I'm in that fear and I believe that there's I'm this little thing and they're this thing that can hurt me and attack me and make me vulnerable I'm I'm caught up in it and so that's why help me see this differently a really strong calling out not just words a calling of the heart hey I really need help here I'm really feeling caught up in this I need another perception I need a miracle. The miracle is going to correct my current perception. But whenever I'm upset or fearful or out of peace, I have a misperception. I'm in the wrong perception. I am in a wrong perception. I am wrong in my perception. That's it. And I can't get out of that without help because I'm stuck in it. It's like being stuck in a rut, in a car. You're in a rut. You can't get out without help. Hey, Holy Spirit, help me. And he lifts you out. Right out. Out we go. You know, if you're bogged in your car, right, out we go, lift you out. You can't get out by yourself. You're sitting in the wheel spinning. You're in the car spinning your wheels. 
I'm over and over in the loop of my thoughts, spinning the wheels of fear, fear, past, past, fear, past, guilt, past, fear of this, fear of that. So that was, I wanted to share that and I've shared that a few times in my talks over times, but that is how we get out of. And Penelope, that's wonderful. And Robin, you did a great job at not responding to your son. Penelope did a great job of responding uh, differently to your brother. Someone, hey, I saw a call for love. And that's it. So our, our lessons now is our whole life is going to somewhere, the character, the little boy, the son, the boss, they're all going to show us what's left in our mind to heal. They're all just popping up as little characters in the movie, in our movie life, in the dream. They're going to pop up and say, hey, I'm going to say this to you now. Can you feel attacked? <laughs> How's your attack? How's your belief in attack? You know? So the next thing, the coronavirus pops up. Oh, I feel attacked. I think I'm going to, I think I'm this little body. Okay, my job is to undo. My job is to undo that. What beliefs have I got? This situation. So I've written it out. That's your work. That's it. Every day, every minute of your life is forgiveness. Practicing forgiveness, it never stops. The minute you wake up, actually all through the night, you can give your night time over to the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, heal my mind during the night. Um, it says uh, in Disappearance of the Universe that the Holy Spirit will work um, in your dreams, help you in your dreams at night, help you heal. You just give everything over. And so if you say, for example, Robin, you've written out um, you're concerned about your son. So in other words, you have to see by what you've written out that you see your son as a body. And the minute you see someone as a body and believe they are a body, you'll believe that they can be attacked. You'll have a belief in the attack and you won't be experiencing yourself as spirit and you won't be helpful. You can't be helpful. Yes, Nikki. I, I was laughing at Robin's story because I have a brother called David <laughs> who is the living embodiment of Robin's fear of what her son could turn into. He's confrontational. <laughs> and I was in a car with him where he lost his temper. And this was in the second year of practicing the course. And he leaned over and leant on the horn. <laughs> oh, you were driving. I was and driving. And so he, he put his hand on the horn and pushed it for you. Yes. <laughs> he got enraged in a car park. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> with another driver <laughs> who was a bit too slow. And that's what he did. And I remember at the time, I did not react to him. I got a shock because I was just sitting there looking forward to the time when the guy who was pulling out would turn and see me and I could give him a big smile. <laughs> then suddenly there's this rage exploding beside me and on the horn. And I went, <laughs> uh, I knew enough not to judge David or anything like that. But I did do this. I said to him as we were driving away, I was quite peaceful. I said to him, David, I am the driver. I do not want you to take over my horn again. And then he went into a bit of story and I just returned it to just the simple statement of, I am the driver. I do not want you to take over my horn again. And he's, he got it. He got, I was saying that and nothing else. And yeah. it just subsided. Yeah. Because in that moment, um, we've all been angry. I know I, I had terrible problems with anger. I, at one stage, I remember, um, you know, I've picked up, I <laughs> just bought these six glasses, <laughs> you know, drinking glasses. <laughs> I just got back from shopping. I had them on the bench. <laughs> and I got so angry, I just picked them up and smashed them on the floor. 
I've smashed chairs. I've picked up pictures off the off the off the uh, wall and smashed them. And I'm like, oh, you know, minutes later, I'm like, what happened there? You're mindless. You're just overtaken by the ego. Um, yeah. So we, when we're with other people, we can just see. I see that they they're just mindless as well. They're just caught up in it. Hi, Kevin. Yes. Thanks, okay. Nikki. Wanted to ask you about um, when you said in the beginning about you throwing all your vitamins away. I was just sort of wary that someone listening to this might just throw all their vitamins in the bin and might actually increase their fear. Um, and about if someone's in a lot of pain, like I think that I would probably tend to maybe judge myself as failing or just judge myself half harshly listening to what you said at the start. Did you want to talk a comment on that? Yeah. Um, so it, it's it, you'll know when you need to throw something away, you'll know. I mean, I, I've shared many, in all my talks, I've shared about how I um, stayed on all my antidepressant medication for quite a long period of um, the purification. So no, you'll, that was just me at that stage of, you'll know when it'll be, uh, the Holy Spirit's in charge when you get off things. I'm sharing my experience. I'm not telling. <laughs> yeah, I know. Everyone, yeah. Um, everyone, you have to be, there's no use feeling guilty for taking something. That's not, I never felt guilty for taking anything um, because he says your belief in it. And I used to say, well, I do. I believe this because it's working. So the antidepressants seem to work. So I had a belief in them. Um, so... Yeah, you don't need to, there's no, there's nothing to prove to anybody else what you're doing and what you're taking. If you're taking vitamins or medication, there is, there's no, no one keeping score. There's nothing to prove. Um, hey, I got off my medication. Look at me. There's no gold star given to anyone for anything. Um, so there's no need to feel bad or guilty if you're still taking stuff. Just the best thing to do is just own your journey, fully own it. This is my journey. It's, a, it's my journey with the Holy Spirit and Jesus. I can talk about it to others. But we're in, we are each um, have our own guide and that guide is in charge of what you need to take, when you need to take it and when and if it ever gets let go because maybe you're never at that you're never at that stage of trusting in the holy spirit enough in this lifetime that you will let go of something it may never occur i didn't know if i would ever be able to let go of my medication and vitamins um i i didn't um i didn't know that uh so you can't know until you get to it. You don't, you don't get to the course and throw everything in the bin while you're still in fear and still have guilt and the belief in attack. But don't, don't do anything in behaviour or throwing things out to try to force yourself to get rid of the belief. Don't, just don't do that. It's not helpful. Admit to yourself, I believe that this helps me and take it. It's just... But there will be a time when your, your mind um, really transcends this worldly stuff and that's the right time and you, ca you can't know that because you can't know anything about your journey. All you can do is practice forgiveness today, right now, whatever's coming up into your awareness, wherever you are uh, and... You can't know what's left to be undone. You can't know what stage you're at in the awakening process. You, you've got no idea. It's not even worth thinking about. Um, so don't even worry about it. I never said, oh, I'm going to throw my medication away. Or I just said, look, I'm going to keep on these antidepressants and do the, do the forgiveness the course is asking me to do. And I even had thought that I might be on antidepressants for the rest of my life. I didn't, 
uh, didn't turn up at groups and say, guess what, I got off antidepressants today and get gold star. And that's, no, and I'm not guilty for it. I never felt guilty for taking anything. It's, it's really, you don't have to worry about it. It's not, it's nothing to show. It's, if you think it's about proving anything to anyone, you're totally off track, totally off track. This is about you and your guide, your internal guide. This is about you getting quiet and getting guidance by your internal guide of how to undo all the ego stuff in your mind. Uh, don't worry about, forget about, as I've said this so many times, forget about looking spiritual, being spiritual. The best thing you can do is just be really honest be as honest as you like. Uh, luckily for me, I really didn't care how anyone thought about me. I mean, I fell to bits on my spiritual path. I went to retreats and cried all weekend and got told off for crying. Um, I got told I was making it all about me. I just couldn't stop crying. So I, I never ever tried to look good or say anything, but, um, but what I did have was I had these moments of clarity where when I understood that the vitamins really weren't doing anything for me, when I really understood it, I then let go of them. I couldn't have let go of them before and I didn't care. If someone came to my house at that stage and uh, they were a Course in Miracles student, I, I wouldn't be scared of saying, oh yeah, I'll take all these vitamins. I didn't just don't worry about proving anything to anyone. It's not, that's not what it's about. So, um, yeah, I really encourage you not to try to act more spiritual or act any more awakened or getting anything more than you are. I encourage you to be really honest as to where you're at and really honestly accept um, correction. Really call out for correction. Really be... You know, don't, you don't have to tell your group what, what you're doing. You just have to tell the Holy Spirit and Jesus. They're the ones that help. But through that, you can help others. So um, it's probably good, Kevin, to clarify that. Um, I've never really, um, really worried about... Um, I've never used spirituality in a way... Um, to make to make myself look good or anything like that, or or I'm, I really didn't care. My so strong desire was to be free. Um, you know, I, I have come across people in a course of miracles groups that use this spirituality and use inquiry to make themselves look <laughs> like. You know, it's just the ego. I think some people call it the spiritual ego, where they try to look like they're a teacher and they try to try to talk about stuff in a way that it's people looking at them in a particular way. Um, and it could even be, hey, I'll throw medication away and then they run home and take it up again because... <laughs> but it really should be a quiet, private thing between you and your guide. Um, I said this the other day, your journey is between you and your guide, it's sacred. And when we come to groups, it's a sharing, um, like for me today, I felt guided to make a recording to help the understanding of what, of what this idea of attack and how, you know, maybe it clarifies this teaching. So when I say I let go of medication and vitamins and things like that uh, it's not it's not said as a way of look at me what I did it was that I I had the realization I couldn't have done it before, prior to that realization um, and that realization came from a really deep calling and a deep commitment to studying the course and accepting Jesus as my teacher and accepting the teachings of the course and, and giving my whole life over to the course's teachings. In other words, I had no other goal but to undo the ego. And so, um, you know, that took 
that took some time for me to even realise that the course was saying it was my thoughts. I mean, it's there, plain as day. But we sometimes it can take us years to really get that and say, oh, he's actually saying it's my thoughts that are cause of all my issues. And like in that lesson then, it's my attack thoughts. These are, these are you know, the, the issue is my, my thoughts, my attack thoughts, the ego stalk thoughts. So that's, and everybody's got a unique journey. You, how you do anything with food, whatever you eat, um, any medication or vitamins you take, some people, you know, sleep on magnetic beds and, you know, whatever you're doing, just do it. Just keep doing it. There's no harm in doing anything. And if you feel part of your journey, there will be something that comes along where it feels, um, actually, I feel like I'm letting go of that. It's craziness to try to throw things away or let go of them when you still when you still when you haven't your mind hasn't healed enough to let it go. You're putting the horse before the cart. You want your mind healed first, and it will naturally fall away in its own time, if and when. And as I said, this world, this this dream, this world. What have you got to prove? If you're someone that says, oh, I'm really feeling guilty because I'm still doing this, this and this, um, and I have to prove something to someone else, that has to be undone. That has to be, that has to be, like who, who are you proving it to? There's one son of God and it's already whole, complete and lovely and never left the mind of God. So you might just even, in that, in knowing that, you might just laugh. Whatever you're doing, whatever you think you're doing or having to prove, there's nothing to prove. There's nothing to get. There's nothing to be because you're already it. <laughs> you, can't, you can't be anything other than your true self. You can try. You can try to be a tiny little body in a little world. You can think you are. It won't work. It won't work because God's calling you all the time. And the calling of God is going to get through at some stage. You're going to come to this place where there has to be another way. There has to be a better way. And you're going to look and the Holy Spirit's going to come in and guide you to whatever path you're, is suitable for you. And then you're going to see that everything you've ever done, even the path you took, the course you're taking, it all, it's already been and done. Everything you do here is already gone and done. It's been and done. It's gone. Nothing here ever happened. So everything, even the journey home's already happened. <laughs> so, so, yeah, it was probably good to explain that out, just so really tell people not to worry about trying to look good. That's just, just forget about that. Just go within. It's all about you and your guide. There's nothing to prove to anyone. And in fact, the best thing is to fall apart, um, you know, cry, um, be really open and be honest about stuff um, because we, we just, we hide so much. And it really is a good way to, um, you know, just, you just really come to God then because you're not, you just let go of trying to put up the persona, the personal, the mask. <laughs> Alrighty, I think that's long enough for recording. What do you think, Kevin? Think it's time to stop? Yep, sounds good. Group. Let's do a little blessing to each other as we finish. Uh, I'm just going to put it on the gallery view here. So... Just let's bless. Let's really have a heart open. This is seeing the Christ, seeing the innocence, seeing the beauty, the holiness. Really good practice. Let's just look at each other. Or just close your eyes and imagine. Just looking at each other's eyes and 
You can just say whatever feels coming from your heart, but I suggest something like I see your innocence. You are the Holy Son of God. You are the beautiful love of God. I love you. I bless you. I honour you. And what we have to remember is that what we're saying is only ourself. Mm, ideas that do not flag their source. So the idea that you are the Christ doesn't leave my mind. It resonates in me. Every thought I have about everything is what I experience. So if I see you as beautiful, whole and perfect and complete, I get that experience and we join together in that. We join in that experience. It's so important to do this. It's the way we heal. Love you guys. Might see you next week. <laughs> Thank you, Kay. Okay. So helpful. Um, anyone else to stay back for a 10-minute meditation, welcome. Otherwise, I'll see you next time.